Please note determinant rule three, progressivism, and Teddy Roosevelt. What we see in the opening slide is that there was a real worry in America that the money trusts, the, the wealth gap was widening to such a degree and the companies were becoming so big that they were destroying America's liberty and freedom and democracy. And so we see that, that the monster here in this picture is the trusts and they have abducted lady freedom um, and we see democracy being threatened by the power of the elite in America. So the origins of this idea that we need to fix America it's really nothing new, it's really a continuation. If you remember in the last time period, in the Gilded Age, there were earlier reform movements, um, whether they be the Greenback Labor Party, the Granger Movement, or the Populace. There was this feeling among farmers that the super elite, the railroad barons, the bankers, the eastern elite, had all the power, and the farmers wanted the government to do something about it. And so this is really the first time that we see in America that we want that people are expecting the government to fix things. They think the government has the answer. In the past, we've had other labor, we've had other reform movements: the Second Great Awakening, Temperance, Abolition, etc. Um, with for the most part, those are all people, individual people, trying to change society's ills. But the farmers are really the first mass, consistent mass movements that are trying to get the government to change things. Now, of course, they didn't succeed at any of this because, as we know, by 1896, the farmers are losing a lot of political power. But in this new unit, um, from 1898 to 1918, we're going to see the rise of a new reform movements that are not farmer-led, that are middle-class-led, and they will be more successful. They also believe, however, the continuity is that they believe, just like the farmers, that the answer to our problems lie in government intervention. And so, number two, mostly composed of middle class and old elites. And so, the movement of this era, of 1898 to 1918, is going to be called the progressive movement. So the populists were the farmers in the last time period, and so now we have the progressives. So who are the progressives? Well, this is a very famous picture that was drawn at the time, is... In the late Gilded Age, we saw the wealth gap develop, and we see that reflected in this picture. The lower classes, the farmers, the factory workers are on the bottom of society, trapped underneath. And then we have the nouveau riche, we have the elite, the captains of industry, um, on top, and they're having a wonderful time. They're in big mansions, and they're dancing on the poor people's heads. Whereas the middle class in all this, we have see the lower class on the bottom, and the upper class on the top with this big wealth gap. Well, the middle class in this representation is the floor. Um, they're in between the two uh, extremes. And on the top, we see the extreme of the wealthy living these opulent lives. On the bottom, we see a growingly angry lower class uh, reflected in the big labor movements of the Gilded Age. And so the progressives are the middle class, and they're caught in the middle. Um, they fear that um, the upper class has become too powerful, as we saw in the previous picture. They're controlling the politics of America, so the middle class has no control over the government. And they're also fearing the lower class beneath them, um, because the lower class is going to want to... Um, hold on just a second. For the delay um, because the lower class wants to um, you know rise up in power and the first people they're going to kill are the people in between the middle class so the progressive movement is is definitely a middle class movement for the most part and um, they f they feel that they have to change America they have to end corruption in the government they have to bring this power of monopolies down to size and if they don't do this then the lower class will be so angry at their position they'll rise up and they'll destroy America and so we see some of the motives of this middle class progressive movement trapped between the upper class and the lower class. So leading the way, certainly bridging the time period between um, the Gilded Age and this new age are the muckrakers. The muckrakers are journalists who, um, they, they write exposés. They go out and they try to expose the evils of what's going on in late Gilded Age society, early progressive era society. Um, 
we see that they are aided by the increase in literacy in America, which we talked about in the last unit. Because people are becoming much more literate, um, and also the cost of printing has gone down. So we have McClure's, Collier's, and Cosmopolitan, not the one that we know today. Um, and these are all very popular magazines, mostly read by women. Um, and they are going to write, this, uh, artists who work for these magazines or authors are going to write a whole series of things exposing the corruption in society. Now, Teddy Roosevelt actually gives them the name the Muckrakers. He says that these journalists are just busy um, exposing all kinds of scandals. They don't offer any solutions, but they're just talking about what's bad about America. And Teddy Roosevelt, being very proud of America, doesn't like this. And so the term muckraker is not, a, is not a nice term. He says all they do is rake up the muck, the dirt in society to expose it. And so we see in this picture, one of the things we're going to talk about in this lecture is the meat scandal. And so, who are some notable muckrakers? The first one is Lincoln Steffens. He writes a, a book called The Shame of the Cities in 1902, and it exposes municipal corruption. Corruption within cities, um, like we've talked about uh, in before, a uh, boss tweed and the tweed ring. You can see him on the left, the large rotund man on the left, and it just says that in cities, everybody else... Um, everybody is corrupt. We have these political machines and they use graft to gain power and position for themselves. And when you ask these people who is destroying the city, they always point to the, some other guy, not themselves. And so he's trying to bring to light uh, municipal corruption. Next, we see Ida Tarbell, and she writes about the evils and the abuses of Standard Oil, Rockefeller Standard Oil. Um, her, her father was a small uh, oil man, and he was put out of business by the big Rockefeller company. And so she felt inspired to talk about all the illegal business practices and the pressure techniques um, that Rockefeller was using to amass his fortune. Then we see David Phillips. David Phillips wrote um, a book called The Treason of the Senate. And like you see in the picture, he says that there's the Senate, but really who's in charge of the United States government? It's not our elected officials. It is the Copper Trust, the Beef Trust, the Iron Trust, the Coal Trust. It's these huge, super powerful trust and monopolies that have so much wealth that they can control the politics in America. So democracy, we really don't have democracy. It's just we're controlled by big corporations. And then last on the slide, we have Ray Standard Baker, and he talks about, in his book, Following the Color Line, he talks about sharecropping and the crop lean system in the South and how that is oppressive to, white, to poor white and African-American farmers, and something must be done. All of these people are trying to put, if you will, a clarion call out to, to let society know that we have to fix things um, to make America better. So the goals of the muckrakers. The goals was just to shock people into caring about an issue. Um, it was, sorry. It was, um, uh, you know, they don't really have a solution to anything. Um, they're not offering a plan. But what they do want to do is they want to say to America, wake up. And once we realize there's a problem, others can come up with a solution. But their job is to wake people up. They hoped that people got involved, more people were aware of the problem, then again, somebody would find a solution and we can make society better. So that's it for the muckrakers. Political goals and successes of the progressive movement. Um, number one, it says increase middle class control of the government. Obviously, the progressives is mostly a middle class movement, and so they believe that they have the answer to making American government better. The rich um, can't be trusted to make America better because they're the trust, they're the monopolies, they're the one corrupting the government. And the lower class also is a source of corruption because the lower class has their political machines that's corrupting city government. And so the middle class believes, since it's their movement, that if they're put in charge, they can fix things. And so what they do is they attack lower class corruption in government by attacking political machines, the tweed ring. They do this by getting rid of the secret, or they by getting rid of the open ballot. If you remember when you went and voted, if you're part of a political machine, uh, the political ward boss, Boss Tweed, he his power all came from knowing who you voted for. Um, and so if you, um, you know, he gave you a job, he gave you a place to live, and you had to give him the vote, so he was able to see who you vote for because they had an open ballot. But if we pass laws at the city level making it a secret ballot, in other words, nobody can know who you vote for, it's illegal for them to find out, then that really significantly cuts down the power of political machines and hopefully makes government at the city level less corrupt. Next, direct primaries. 
Um, direct primaries is a way of trying to once again attack what we had called on the Jackson era King Caucus. That instead of having the super elite monopolies um, and nouveau riche uh, be in charge of political parties um, and they pick the candidates, what we're going to do is we're going to let the people pick the candidates for their own parties. And so um, now, and most of us have direct parties now, primaries now, is the candidates that want to be president for, let's say, the Republican Party, they will go around and make promises to the common man, to the middle class man, and say, look, if you elect me, I'm going to clean up government. I'm going to make sure that we have better, uh, safer food being produced in our factories, better working environments. So they're making promises to the common man. It's the common man who choose who is going to be uh, their political candidate to run for president. So that's what they do in these primaries. It's a series of elections where just party members pick um, their candidate instead of the elite. Direct election of senators, just like we saw in the previous slide um, where we believe that monopolies are controlling the Senate. Um, now we're going to make the, the senators be directly elected by the people, not elected by, um, as, if you remember in the past, as the Constitution was originally written, um, people elected their state legislatures, and then the state legislatures, the elite of the state, would pick the state senators. And that was too much room for corruption, too far removed from the common people. So let's have the senators actually be directly elected by the people. These are all the goals of uh, the progressive movement, the political goals. Then we have something called the city commissioner movement. Um, now, up until this point, um, most municipalities were controlled by political machines. Um, and so the ward, the ward boss, Boss Tweed, was able to you know, control elections. And so he was able to get the mayor elected. And then the mayor would pull, uh, you know, select the police commission, the police, uh, the head of the chief of police, and select you know, the chief of garbage disposal or whatever. And all of these would be cronies or people who owed the political boss a favor. And so the government at the city level was very corrupt. But what we decided here is we want to have uh, uh, all of these efficient, all of the parts of a government, whether it be roads and bridges, um, police, uh, the mayor's office, whatever, we want all of them to be elected, uh, all of them to be separate. And so th no one person can appoint every single person in the city government having complete control of the government. And so what we're going to have is we're going to have, we're going to split up the job of the mayor into a whole bunch of different departments. And so we'll have the police commissioner. I um, mean, he is not going to be controlled by some political boss because he's just in charge of the police. And then we'll have the city waste disposal commissioner. We'll have all of these people. So we'll divide up the role of government among a bunch of different people. Um, and so no one one man has control of the entire city. Then we get the city manager movement. Um, this is also going to be for progressivism. And once again, the goal is to wipe out corruption in politics, but also to make the city more efficient. Um, and so the city manager is not somebody who's elected. Um, it is somebody who is hired by the city because they have gone to college. They have um, some kind of a degree or proof that they can actually manage a city. They're not just some politician. This will make for a much more efficient um, city government because people are actually um, trained in waste disposal or uh, police work. Um, and so a city manager is more of a, a skilled position. Of course, this benefits the middle class because these city managers are often middle class people who've gone to college, so it firmly puts them in power in the city instead of some lower class ward boss. Um, both the city commissioner and the city manager movement got their start because there was a large hurricane um, that hit Galveston, Texas. And when the people were trying to rebuild Galveston, there was so much corruption in the city that a lot of the money the taxpayers were raising to fix their city was just being put in the pockets of the political machine. And so the people of Galveston rose up and said, no, no, we need to have um, each department be separate in the city and be uh, controlled by the people directly. So the city commissioner and the city manager movement was born in Galveston. So let's ask the question, is the progressive movement for more efficient, um, less corrupt government, or is it to weaken the lower class and by extension giving the middle class more power? This is something that historians have argued. Were the, the middle class progressives really altruistic? Did they really want to make 
society better, cities better, less corrupt, or was it just a power grab by the middle class to weaken the other two classes, to weaken the lower classes power of the city government um, and the elite power of the, of the national government? Um, I think you can argue things for both ways as we've seen on this slide. So increased middle class control of the government continued. Um, and so now let's look at the, at the state level. Right? And so what we're going to get is, this is the city and state level, we get these new things pop up in American politics, um, and they are all to, one, make government more efficient, or two, to make government less corrupt. And so the first thing we have is the initiative. And it says that you can force politicians to vote on a bill they don't want to bring up. Um, let's say that the city of Denver is controlled by, I'm just making this up, a, a, a large ice cream making company. Um, and the ice cream making company um, passes laws that limits competition there. The only ice cream maker in the city I and mean, they pass laws that say that you know everybody in the city has to buy ice cream from this one company um, and so uh, you know the people in the city think this is unfair they think that the city is being controlled by the ice cream company and so they want their state legislature or their city government to pass a law saying that we can have other ice cream companies I know it's a silly analogy just go with it um, or you know we don't have to buy from this company but the politicians in the state and the city are too scared of the big ice cream company trust or they get too much money from them in the form of bribes and so they won't bring up the law. The people cannot get their local politicians to make the changes they want to be made because they're controlled by, and they're corrupt, and they're controlled by big business. And so the initiative is a way for the voters to force the state legislature or the city council to take uh, a vote on some controversial topic. This way, if they vote the way the people want, we know that they're not controlled by big business. If they vote against the people, we know they are, and we can get rid of them in the next election. So the initiative is giving people control over their elected representatives. Next, the referendum. The referendum just says, forget it, our state or legislature or city government is too corrupt. We, the initiative won't even work. We can't get them to put it on the ballot. And so it really just does away with representative democracy altogether. And it says that the people themselves are going to make the laws. And so a referendum, you give it to the people on an election day, they decide if we're going to have this or that. And we don't, because we just don't trust our elected officials. They're too corrupt. So the people are going to make the decision. And then the next one we have is the recall. Let's say that we find out that a politician is corrupt. He's controlled by some trust, whether it be the ice cream trust or the oil trust. Um, and so we don't wait for their term to be ended, um, we just go ahead and get rid of them now. We have a special election, it's called a recall, and the voters, are the voters are deciding if they want that politician to continue their term or if they want to get rid of them and replace them now with somebody else. It's instantaneous control by the population against their government. And then we have regulation. Um, regulation is the idea that the government should control business. They should regulate it. They should say what business can and can't do for the benefit of society, whether that's safer working conditions or safer food for consumers. Go into factories and make sure that, you know, whereas you go into a meat packing plant and you make sure that they're, they're following certain health protocols. All of these things we do a lot today in 2000, uh, you know, in the 2000s, but, um, you know, back at the end of the Gilded Age, the beginning of the aggressive movement, we don't have any of this. If you remember, the government took a hands-off or laissez-faire approach to business. And so now these middle-class progressives want the government to start regulating businesses because we believe the government is the answer. It's the way to fix society. The, the most uh, popular or famous progressive at the state level is a guy by the name of Robert M. La Follette. He is a progressive governor from Wisconsin, and he believes in a lot of the progressive uh, things we're going to be talking about. More efficient government, less waste, um, less corruption. And so Wisconsin is going to be leading the way um, to try to fix society through the government. And so he will be a, a famous progressive governor. So let's go into more uh, reforms of the progressives. Increased middle class control of government continued. We're going to have a big movement once again for women's suffrage. Now we've seen this before the Civil War. Women said we should have the right to vote because we're equal to men. That didn't work. After the Civil War and the Gilded Age, women said we should have the vote because 
we're different than men. We're caring. Um, so you should, if we want to fix society, you should give women the right to vote. And that does work in states out west. But what about eastern states? Uh, in many eastern states, women still don't have the right to vote. Um, and so we see this become a major issue of the progressives. And eventually, at the end of the progressive era, at the end of this unit, women actually will get the right to vote because of the progressive idea that we need to fix society. So this finally comes together, men and women uniting to believe that they can fix society to make it better. So we see in the in the, in the political poster here, give mother the vote. Our food, our health, our play, our homes, our school all work, right? There's this idea that women are more caring than men, they're less corruptible, um, and so if we give women the right to vote, they will try to make things better, certainly more than men voters. But there's another reason we can see this too, maybe a more nefarious reason, is that the progressives are able to double their control of the government. If we give progress, if we give women the right to vote, the biggest group of women that are going to be voting are middle class women. Lower class women perhaps are too uneducated or too busy to vote because um, they're working all the time. Upper class women don't have the numbers to control politics, but the middle class women have the time and the numbers to control the vote. And so by middle class men, they're convinced to give women the right to vote because not only can they vote, but now their wives can vote. And so we double the power of the middle class. So this is a way of looking at the middle of the progressive movement, not as a genuine effort to try to fix society, but to try, it's a power grab to try to get the middle class more power. So again, we see these two views of the progressive movement. Um, we've already talked about that. Next. Uh, number two, constitutional success. So we've talked about the progressives. What are their goals at the local level, the municipal level, and the state level? And now let's talk about do they actually have any success at the national level? And the answer is, of course, yes. They're going to pass a whole series of constitutional amendments. The 16th Amendment, the Federal Income Tax of 1913. You know, if you remember, we briefly had an income tax at the end of the Civil War, uh, or during the Civil War, and then it ended. Um, but this was, a, this was a, something that the Populist Party wanted to reduce the wealth gap. They wanted a graduated income tax. And the progressives want that too. They want to bring the power of the elite down to size. Um, and so what we're going to see is that the United States government does create a federal income tax in 1913. And it is a graduated income tax that we still have today. Um, and the goal of it was not necessarily to raise money, raise money for the government, but it was to shrink the wealth gap. Let's tax the richest people the most, reduce some of their wealth and so now that we'll see the rich won't have as much power in the government and society um, next we see that the income tax is also going to do something that all middle class and lower class consumers want they want to reduce the tariff if you remember in the past um, the elite said we need a tariff because that's the only way to raise money for the government and we once had a surplus but we got rid of it because we're funding the grand army of the republic the civil war veterans um, and so uh, supporters of big business said we have to have a tariff to run the government. Um, but now we don't need a tariff anymore because we have another source of income to fund the government, the income tax. And so there is no reason to justify having these high tariffs. And so the 16th Amendment is going to help middle and lower class people in both ways. It's going to shrink the wealth gap, but it's also going to give us an excuse to get rid of the tariff. Next, constitutional success continued, we have the 17th Amendment. And so even though the populace wanted this as well, um, they're farmers, and farmers didn't have a lot of political power anymore, and so the middle class voter will get it done. The progressives get direct election of senators also in 1913, giving more power um, to the common man. And again, this was something highlighted by um, the muckrakers who said that the, you know, the treason of the Senate, the Senate is controlled by the super elite. And so now, instead of the trust control the Senate. We hope that the people can because the senators have to try to get reelected directly from the people. Next we have the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment is finally going to realize the dream of all those temperance movements. We are going to outlaw the consumption and the production and the sale of alcohol. Um, it passes in 1919. Um, we'll talk more about this when we get to World War One. World War One plays a significant role in trying to get rid of, of alcohol. Um, but the 18th Amendment, how it fits in the progressive movement before we get to World War One, is that they believe that we need to clean up cities. Um, and one of the reasons that cities are so bad and that there's so much crime um, and there's so much poverty is because men drink too much. Um, and so if we can outlaw the consumption of alcohol, we 
will make our cities better places and will help the lives of the lower class. Now, of course, the lower class, a lot of these immigrants, alcohol is a part of their culture at this time, um, and they don't want middle class people, these white Anglo-Saxon Protestant middle class people, telling them what they can and cannot drink. So we see that the pot, that the progressive movement is kind of a, um, a, a patriarchal, I don't know if you say patriarchal, it is a paternalistic, there you go, it's a paternalistic way of looking at things, that we, the middle class, know what's best for everybody, and so we're going to enforce our values of temperance on you. And so is the, the progressive movement an attempt to make things better, perhaps? Is it a way for the middle class to get more power and to tell the lower class what to do? Perhaps we have these two different ways of looking um, at the the pop the progressive movement, and then we get the Nineteenth Amendment, and women finally do get the right to vote. As we've seen on a previous slide, we talked about their motives for trying to give women the right to vote, and eventually they do. Um, in 1919, 1920, and the Nineteenth Amendment is passed, and women have the right to vote. This also has a lot to do with World War One, and we'll talk more about that later. So those are the constitutional amendments, and so now let's talk about the progressivism and how they interact with labor. So we have, let's talk about women and children first, because you remember um, in the Gilded Age, this was something that um, Mother Jones and Florence Kelly were advocating for, that we should uh, end sweatshops, we should end child labor, it's, it's harmful to the family, um, it's harmful to children, it's dangerous working conditions. And so the progressives decide to take on this challenge as well. And, and really the thing that, that, that pushes this movement into the nation's eye more than anything else is there was this horrible fire in a factory in a sweatshop. Um, in 1911, it was called the Triangle Shirtwaist Company Fire. And it was a sweatshop where women would um, be locked in and they would get paid by the piece. And so there was tremendous pressure for them to work as fast as they could and their bosses didn't want them to have breaks um, and so they locked them in and a fire started in the factory and the women couldn't get out um, and 148 46 women uh, burned to death um, and because it's women um, and it was such a horrible fire and occurrence and so many women died um, it becomes front page news and it convinces people that the that the progressives are right we do need to end sweatshops or at least make things more safe for women and children so we start to see laws being passed that says that companies can't force women to work in sweatshops or there are certain positions in factories that it's too dangerous for women and they shouldn't be in those positions um, and so of course companies sue because they want women and children working in their factories they can pay them less this is good for business and so it goes to the Supreme Court and we get this case called Mueller versus Oregon it says that states actually can pass laws to limit um, jobs for women there can be women there can be jobs that women and children um, can be barred from at the state level um, because they're just too dangerous there should be reserved for men uh, so this is this is certainly a victory for the worker in a way they're going to so now we see women and children not working in really dangerous conditions but once again it's kind of a, a way of the middle class you know forcing their values on the lower class because they do, you know, a lot of lower class people, they need their wives and their children to work in these jobs to pay the bills. And so we see, again, the two views of the progressive movement. Is the progressive movement a, 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 a real kind-hearted attempt by the middle class to, to help the lower class have safer working conditions? Absolutely. Is it also um, a way for them to enforce their values that women should be in the cult of domesticity and children should be in school getting education? Absolutely. You can look at the progressive movement in both ways. And so this also involves child labor. And if you remember, we've talked about how children were working in factories or in mines because for two reasons, they can get paid cheaper. And also they have little tiny hands and little tiny feet and they can go into places that adults can't. And so Mueller versus Oregon applies to them as well. Next, improving the workplace. So in the Gilded Age, workers formed all kinds of unions. They went on strikes um, to try to improve workplace conditions. So they wanted shorter hours. They wanted safer conditions. They wanted more pay. 
Um, and when they didn't get these things, they went on strike, and we had some pretty violent strikes in the Gilded Age. These strikes become increasingly radical as we get through the Gilded Age, and it starts to worry the middle class. As you remember that picture in the very beginning of this PowerPoint, the middle class is worried that things will get so bad for workers that we might have a communist revolution in America. And then all rich people, whether they're middle class or rich, will lose their wealth and power, and we don't want that to happen. Um, and so the middle class, through state and local efforts, they start to pass workplace safety laws. That uh, if you're going to have if you're going to work in a dangerous factory, the, um, there has to be certain things that will help you out. You, you know, you have to have proper ventilation. You have to have good um, sight of things. You have to be able to have good lighting. Um, we are going to set the maximum work day to 10 hours a day, so no more 12 to 15 hour shifts where workers are exhausted. Um, and so we see at the state level, we start to see all of these laws passed. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, from the right, we see Carnegie Steel Mills, of course, the super elite won't like this, the factory owners, because they want to have long hours so they can hire fewer workers. But now, unlike the populace and the labor unions, the middle class progressives have enough power, there's enough voters, that they're able to get these laws passed. Um, on the left-hand side, we see a meatpacking plant, and these were horrible places to work as well. Um, <coughs> what you see there is a typical meatpacking packing plant in Chicago. Um, and in the winter time, if you can imagine, they bring in the cows, they kill the cows, and when the hot blood of the cows um, hits the cold air of Chicago, it creates steam. And so this factory, um, this meatpacking plant would be just uh, so full of steam that the workers couldn't see what they're doing. Um, and as they haul the cows up and put them on this moving assembly line, um, where they start to cut the cows up into, into halves and then quarters, the guts are spilling on the floor, the blood is spilling on the floor, it's very slippery. Um, all of you can't see what's going on. Soon the cold air turns the blood to ice. You're slipping all over the place. You've got these sharp knives, and you start cutting things. And before you know it, you've lost a finger, you've lost an arm. Uh, somebody gets killed, but you can't see it, and so they get ground up with the meat. The humans do just like everything else. Um, the factory floors are dirty and filthy. They also get um, um, packaged in the meat. If you remember. During the Spanish-American War, a lot of American casualties were from bad meat um, that was sent to the troops. And so we see that the middle class, they want to improve workplace um, hours and conditions to help the workers so they don't rebel. But also we can see that the middle class, they're consumers as well. In fact, they're the, the biggest consumers in America. They can afford to buy a lot of these goods. And so we see that the progressives also have an emphasis on consumer safety. They want to make sure that we pass workplace regulations that are going to make a safe working environment and a clean working environment. But those laws will also help consumers have cleaner, better food as well. And so here we have our our first national conservative. We talked about Robert M. Lafollette at the state level. So now we need a national figure that we can use as an example of um, progressivism. Um, and so we see Teddy Roosevelt, the radical conservative, which are two things that you wouldn't normally put together. Radical is somebody who wants drastic change. Conservative is somebody who fights against it. So how can he be both? Well, when Teddy Roosevelt becomes president because of the assassination of McKinley and then gets elected in his own right, um, he comes up with something called the Square Deal. Um, and so what we see, the Square Deal is the name for his domestic legislative agenda. And Teddy Roosevelt is a progressive. And so he says that the government should exist not to make everybody equal, he's not a communist, but the government should exist so that everybody has the same start in life. So that some people aren't more privileged than others. And so if we want to use the analogy that life is like a race, we see that Teddy Roosevelt believes it's the government's job to make sure that everybody has the same starting line. That everybody's going to have um, good working conditions. That everybody's going to have access to you know, a healthy city. Um, that they're going to have access to education. Um, and so everybody has a start in life. But then he says, it is your, it's up to the person, the individual, to determine how you finish in life. Um, maybe you have more talent, maybe you're a hard worker. That's great, then you're going to finish, you're going to have wealth and power, and that's wonderful. But let's get away of the days where the elite just control America, and the poor never have a chance, or the middle class never have a chance to rise up, because there's such a wealth gap. And so he's a radical because he believes that the government should, should certainly regulate, and the government should uh, make sure that everybody has um, good working conditions and education and so forth. 
But he's conservative because he's not a socialist, he's not a communist. He doesn't believe that everybody is going to be equal at the end. Um, that it's just really up to your own individual talents. So he kind of blends the two. So he says that monopolies and trusts and the elite control, they don't give people a square deal um, because they give elite all the power in America. And so he is going to do his best to make sure that the monopolies and the trusts um, do what he says, that if he says that you're being unfair, you're not giving people a fair shake in life, a square deal, then you have to either change your ways or he will attack you. We'll see more about this in the slides. And so we're going to see government intervention into the business world so that people have a square deal or a fair chance at life. So let's put this with some specific examples. When Teddy Roosevelt becomes president, uh, we're about to go into a long, cold winter, and the coal miners in Pennsylvania, once again, if you remember the Molly Maguires in the Gilded Age, they're once again um, threatening to go on strike. They want a nine-hour day, which is a lot less than they were working, down from 12 or 11, um, and they want 20% more pay, so they want less work and more pay because they say our our, our working conditions are really dangerous and we don't want to spend our whole lives in these dangerous mines for almost no pay you can see we talked about in the past cave-ins are a real possibility um, explosions are a possibility and of course as you can see in the top right picture that is a worker emerging from the mines in a day and all that coal dust gets all over his face imagine what his lungs look like and so these workers have really horrible working conditions so they want more pay for it um, and so they threaten to go on strike now, we're about to enter this cold winter, and Teddy Roosevelt knows that America uses coal to heat their homes, and he knows that the voters will be angry if they can't heat their homes because there's a coal strike, and there's just not enough coal. And so, for the first time in American history, the president gets between business and their labor unions. Instead of, instead of just immediately taking the side of the owners of the mine, President Roosevelt, he invites both the union, the workers, and the coal owners of the mind to come in and talk about their issues and resolve the issues so there's no strike. And um, the, the owners of the business uh, refuse to work with the, with the labor union. And, you know, hours pass and they're not getting anything done. And so Teddy Roosevelt threatens the owners of the union. He says, look, if you don't fix this strike and settle with the union, I'm going to throw you out the window. <laughs> so the president is certainly, uh, you know, we know Teddy Roosevelt by now. Um, he threatens to throw them out the window and he says, um, that you know, who knows if he'll actually throw him out the window, but he says, also, I will have the United States Army come in and take over control of your coal mines. I am not going to let the United States population go cold this winter. And so he says, settle the strike. And so what we see here um, is that Teddy Roosevelt is intervening for the very first time, but this time on the side of the labor unions. Certainly, this is a great example of periodization. We are now seeing the federal government take the side of the workers, forcing the companies to settle with the unions in a way that benefits the unions. So this is the famous anthracite coal strike where Teddy Roosevelt seems to be a champion of the common man. Next, so Teddy Roosevelt gets the nickname the Trust Buster. So we'll see if that's true or not. But Teddy Roosevelt creates the Department of Labor and Commerce. It's a brand new part of the executive branch. And the goal of the Department of Labor and Commerce is to mediate labor issues. Um, and so that's the labor part of their, of their name. And so let's say that there's going to be a big strike threatened, or there is a strike between a steel company and their workers, or between uh, a mine owner and their workers. Teddy Roosevelt believes that the government has a responsibility to go in and mediate this strike. In other words, talk to both sides and make sure that they come together and they come up with a good solution for both sides. Um, so we see the government intervening in the economy, certainly not laissez-faire. Um, the also the Department of Labor and Commerce, their second job is to investigate improper trusts. And what I mean by improper trusts is Teddy Roosevelt believes that there are two things. There's good trusts 
and there's bad trusts. Um, a good trust is a trust that, let's, let's make it simple, does what Teddy Roosevelt says. If he believes that the trust is, causing, is charging too much for their goods, if they're too corrupt and controlling the government, um, if they're acting more powerful than they should be, he calls them, he says, you guys need to stop this. And if they listen to him um, and they do what the president says, they're a good trust. If they don't listen to him and they don't settle the dispute with the labor union, or if they don't um, bring down their prices, he calls them a bad trust. And so Teddy Roosevelt says that the executive branch, the federal government should be in charge, uh, not in charge of businesses, but the final say. Right? And so we see this, this distinction between good trust and bad trust. And so there we see Teddy Roosevelt. It's a great political picture because you see a bad trust he kills. He is going to destroy their companies and bust them up into a bunch of smaller competing companies, giving uh, consumers uh, lower prices for their goods. Um, for good trust, good trust that are on a leash, they do what Teddy Roosevelt says. He can kind of control them a little bit. Um, so we see the little bear. He's cowering under Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and so the trust is allowed to continue, um, but as long as they do what the federal government says. And so here's another example of him being a radical conservative. He's a radical because he believes that the government should regulate trust. He should tell trust what they can and cannot do. But he's a conservative because he doesn't say that we should just get rid of all big business. As long as big business behaves and um, does what the government says when the government intervenes, they can say they're fine. All right. So our example of Teddy Roosevelt going over a trust is we have John uh, J.P. Morgan, um, and he has a company called the Northern Securities Company. It's a big railroad company. Um, and they were charging farmers exorbitant rates to haul their freight. And so the farmers craft Teddy Roosevelt to help them. And so Teddy Roosevelt goes to J.P. Morgan and he says, okay, you guys are charging too high of rates. So knock it off. And J.P. Morgan says, you can't tell me what to do. Who do you think you are to tell me what to do? I'm J.P. Morgan. And so Teddy Roosevelt then goes after the trust. He busts it up into a, small, a bunch of smaller competing companies. So here we, again, we see this is not the Gilded Age anymore. It's not laissez-faire. Teddy Roosevelt's able to go in and twist the arm, as you can see in the picture, of big trust and tell them what to do. Either you lower your rates or I'm going to bust you up into a bunch of little companies. Um, and so we see that Northern Securities companies, Teddy Roosevelt would consider a bad trust because they didn't do what he said. Next, railroads. So we get to see a series of laws passed that try to regulate railroads. The first one is in 1903. It's called the Elkins Act. And it, it is going to see that the United States government is going to fine railroad companies if they, have, if they charge farmers too much to haul their freight. Um, also, they cannot use secret rebates. Remember, we talked about that as a way for um, railroad companies to drive weaker railroad companies out of business. Teddy Roosevelt wants competition in the business world. He wants to make sure that consumers are paying cheap prices as much as they can and that farmers are helped. Um, he is a Republican after all, and Republicans usually are trying to help farmers. So the Elkins Act is passed. Next, we see the Help Burn Act of 1906. Um, it uses the ICC, which if you remember was created um, in the Gilded Age, but we're actually going to use it for what it was intended for this time. Instead of helping big railroad companies get rid of small railroad companies, we're going to actually see it be used to go after big railroad companies. And so the ICC says that they can nullify and set maximum railroad rates. In other words, if a railroad company is defying the Elkins Act and they are still charging high rates even though they're being fined by the government, the United States government can come in and tell this private business, the railroad company, how much they can charge for their rates. Um, so say, forget it, you're charging 15 cents a pound or whatever it is. We think that five cents a pound is fair, and so we're going to do this. And so this is an example of regulation. The federal government coming in and telling private businesses what they can and cannot do. So certainly not laissez-faire anymore. Next, consumer safety. Um, so we see that Teddy Roosevelt um, is exemplifying another aspect of the progressive movement. It's not just to get rid of corruption and put government in charge of businesses and lower the wealth gap, but it's also to take care of consumers, middle class consumers. And so I had mentioned in a previous slide about the meatpacking industry, um, and this was really a concern for a lot of consumers, that the, that the meatpacking industry was giving them tainted food, rat infested food, uh, maybe with human parts ground up with dirt in it, and so it wasn't safe for people. Um, and this came to life because of a muckraker, a guy by the name of Upton Sinclair. He writes a book called The Jungle. 
And he upped in Sinclair Minute to be an expose on worker safety um, and working conditions. And in the book, it's a fictitious book, but it's set, it's based on reality. Um, he talks about how these immigrants from Eastern Europe, new immigrants, they're coming to Chicago and they're working long hours and horrible conditions um, in these meatpacking plants. But in the book, he also describes some of the horrible uh, things that gets ground up into this meat. And so the public of the United States reads this book um, and they get upset about what's in their food supply. Um, and so Upton Sinclair, he, he once said that once people were reading his book, that he was aiming for their hearts. He was trying to get them upset about what's happening to the workers, but instead he hit their stomach. People were more upset about what was going into their food. So because of the public outroar of this, Teddy Roosevelt gets the Meat Inspection Act passed. And we see in the picture, now the federal government is going to send in meat inspectors, and they're going to check the quality and the uh, of the meat. They're going to make sure that there is clean conditions in the, in the factory, um, that, that the factory is not cutting corners, that they're doing everything they can to make sure that the meat is pure meat. It doesn't have ground up horse in it or it doesn't have uh, rat feces or, or glass or anything like that. And if they have any of these things, the, f the factory will be fined or shut down. And so we see that the government is regulating business again. They're taking on business for the benefit of the middle class and lower class consumer. Next, we get the Pure Food and Drug Act passed in the same year. Um, it basically says that what the uh, company says is in their product has to be true. Um, you have to have stuff in the product that you're selling to people. It has to be uh, true, what you're telling them is in it, and also it has to be something that won't kill you. Um, and so we have this famous ad, it's Lydia E. Pinkham's Pills for Constipation. It says in the ad that it's going to cure constipation. It could even perhaps cure cancer. Um, it's going to make all of uh, anybody who's feeling sick better. It's, it's a cure-all, a magical pill. Um, and consumers were complaining about this because who really knows what's inside of this thing? It's not made of what it says it's made of. It doesn't cure what it says it cures. And so the federal government steps in and it regulates businesses and it says you can't sell these things to consumers. Um, you have to have, you know, pure food and drug, right? You can't have anything that might cause people harm. And we're going to inspect what you put in these things. And if you're putting bad things in, we'll find you or shut you down. Once again, regulation. Next, the Newlands Act, 1902. The federal government is going to help farmers again, but this time farmers in the West. Um, and we have talked about this before. The federal government is now going to start to pay for reservoirs and dams out West. Um, they were going to, st so that now we can have water year round in places we need it. And so now Western farmers that are in the very dry West can start to take advantage um, of all of this land that previously was too dry to farm. Because of this, we're going to see many more people start to take advantage of the Homestead Act than did in the Gilded Age because it was just too dry before. Next, conservation. Um, so in the Gilded Age, we saw that the factories, in our search for wealth and resources and um, production, we were starting to chop down a lot of our trees, we were starting to mine with hydro mining, we were destroying our environment. And in the Gilded Age, we did see the beginning of the Sierra Club, um, and we did see the creation of some national parks, Yellowstone and Yosemite. Um, but now there's going to be a renewed push for even more conservation. Middle class uh, people are going to say we want to go enjoy America's nature. We don't want it to be all destroyed in our quest for wealth and, and production. And so there becomes this big debate in America which is more important to have beautiful spaces or to have raw materials and resources for our factory, to have jobs for people. And so we have to decide which is more important or can these two things peacefully coexist? Can we have forests but also lumberjack jobs? Um, so in the Gilded Age, we saw John Muir, who um, uh, we had talked about him creating the Sierra Club. And so we see finally the federal government start to really take even more action on the topic of conservation. And so Teddy Roosevelt is going to appoint um, a, a new person as the chief forester. His name is Gifford Pinchot. Um, and so what we see, it's his job to make sure um, that our forests are managed correctly. And Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt come up with an idea called multiple land use resource management. I know that's a mouthful. But what it basically means is that multiple land use means is that it doesn't have to be either or. 
we can still have forests in America that hunters and nature hikers can enjoy, but we can also cut down a part of that forest for logging industry, for the raw materials we need, multiple land use resource management. And so the federal government will come in and they will tell logging companies, you guys can log every 10th tree over here this year, and then you have to move to a new section of the forest, and then another section of the forest in the following year. And this way, not all the trees are being cut down, and we're not over extending our um, destruction of the of the forest we're we're just taking a little bit of it at a time and so everybody can use the forest logging companies but they haven't destroyed all the trees so um, hunters can still go and enjoy the forest or nature um, nature seekers Next, conservation continued. We see that the Teddy Roosevelt is going to continue what we did in the Gilded Age and start to create a whole bunch of national parks. Now, we already had Yellowstone and Yosemite, but what he's going to do is he's going to create new national parks. And so we see Crater Lake out west created. It's a big volcano. It's gorgeous. That it has been a, a long dormant and then filled in with water. And it's a beautiful place. And Teddy Roosevelt says, look, we should have some, some places that are so beautiful that we shouldn't um, that we shouldn't destroy them in our search for wealth. Also, he's going to create national parks and national monuments that have historical significance. And so Mesa Verde is created. Um, it's part of the national park system where um, there are Indian, um, Native American uh, ruins that are there from thousands of years ago. Um, and so we want to maintain that. And so the federal government is going to take it over and say to private business, look, this is something that has historical significance for the United States, um, or it's something that's beautiful on the left. And so these this is hands off. This is an area that has to be um, protected and preserved for the future of Americans to enjoy. Uh, of course, we had talked about this in the Gilded Age, and I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, one of the people who has a, a large impact on Teddy Roosevelt and influencing him to do these things is John Muir, uh, the founder of the Sierra Club. And he says that everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt is an avid hunter, and he enjoys the outdoors. And so he spends a, a week with John Muir camping, and John Muir is able to impress upon Teddy Roosevelt the need to increase the national park system in America. And so we see these two working together to preserve um, and conserve our nation's forests and historic sites. So just a couple more examples. We see Devil's Tower in Wyoming created in the top right-hand corner because it's so unique and beautiful. That becomes part of the national park system. And then we see also the petrified forest in the southwest. Um, it is trees that existed a million years ago, um, and they have since been fossilized. Um, and before this time, tourists were coming in. They were taking the petrified trees out. Um, and so Teddy Roosevelt makes this part of the park system so that we have future generations who can enjoy it. Now, there are limits to his conservation. Um, we uh, see um, now, in the, so what we see here is this idea that we're going to, on the left hand side, we see a beautiful environment, and on the right hand side, we see what happens when industry comes in and uses it for hydroelectricity. Um, we destroy the environment. And so here we see in, in a dramatic way um, how Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir felt about uh, making sure we still have beautiful spaces left, even um, in the face of all this growing rapid industrialization. So here is Teddy Roosevelt's limit though. Teddy Roosevelt doesn't believe that we should completely save all of our resources. There was this uh, this valley called Hetch Hetchy. Um, it is not that far out of San Francisco. It's right next to Yosemite National Park. Um, and it looks a lot like Yosemite. You have this beautiful valley with these granite uh, walls and waterfalls coming down into the valley. And John Muir said to Teddy Roosevelt, look, we have to save this valley. Um, but Teddy Roosevelt doesn't know because the people of San Francisco, they say, look, we'd love to dam up this valley because it's got this water going through it. And we need the, we need the water for the growing population of San Francisco. And we want the water and also want to turn it into a hydroelectric dam. And so John Muir says, how can you do this? If you dam this up, it'll destroy the beauty of the valley forever. And so Teddy Roosevelt, if he was a complete conserv if he was a complete conservationist, he would have taken John Muir's side. But he isn't. Remember, he believes in multiple land use resource management, something for everybody. 
And so Teddy Roosevelt says, go ahead and dam Hetch Hetchy, dam the valley. He says, we already have Yosemite right next door, and that's enough for nature lovers. But we also need to think about industry, and we need to think about urbanization, and the people of San Francisco need their water and electricity. And so um, Muir observed, dam Hetch Hetchy, as well dam for, the, uh, dam for water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been constructed by the heart of man. John Muir is dedicated to preserving this valley, but Teddy Roosevelt, again, says, no, we already have uh, enough beautiful places. We also need stuff for um, urbanization and industrialization. So that's a great example of the limits of his conservation. Now, Teddy, almost done. So Teddy Roosevelt, he serves his uh, term and a half. He becomes president when McKinley is assassinated, and then he serves his own full term, and then Teddy Roosevelt says, I'm done, I'm not going to be president anymore, I want to go enjoy life before I get too old. And so he goes on a safari, actually, to Africa, um, and so he says, look, I I'm going to go kill big animals in Africa. And so he's so tremendously popular, not with big business, but with people, with middle class consumers, that... Teddy Roosevelt's a lot like Andrew Jackson. He can tell people, look, this is who you should vote for, and they'll vote for him because they still like him. And so as Teddy Roosevelt is leaving the White House to go on safari, see him taking his big stick with him, we'll talk about that um, more, um, he hands all his policies and his, his ideas of progressivism off to his successor, his chosen successor. Um, we have a guy by the name of Taft, who is going to be the next president of the United States. Um, and so what we see is in the election of 1908, um, the South is going to vote for um, William Jennings Bryan, who runs again as a Democrat. Now, the South is solidly Democrat because the Reconstruction is over and they hate the Republicans, the party of Lincoln. So they'll vote Democrat for a really long time. But now the farmers are back in the hands of the Republican Party. The Democrat slash populist coalition is over. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt has done things to help farmers again. Uh, he started to regulate railroad rates. He started to, you know, the Newlands Act um, that's helping farmers out west. And so farmers like the Republican Party. And, of course, the, all the factory workers in the Northeast and the middle class people in the Northeast in those cities like Teddy Roosevelt. And so we see that because of the popularity of Teddy Roosevelt, um, William Howard Taft is going to get elected kind of on Teddy Roosevelt's coattails. Um, Taft is not the best of presidents. Um, we see that he will be overwhelmed by the office. He's going to have some difficult times trying to deal with all of uh, the politicians and the big business. Um, and, you know, he tries his first two years, he does try to can do um, more progressive ideas. In fact, he even busts up more trust than Teddy does. Um, but, however, as time goes on, he understands that Teddy Roosevelt's looking over his shoulder. Teddy Roosevelt comes back from um, safari, and he looks and he says, oh my gosh, my chosen successor is doing a horrible job at the government. He looks like he's overwhelmed. He doesn't know what's going on. And so Taft has a choice. He understands that Teddy Roosevelt might come back and run again in 1912. And Taft says, well, the heck with that. I want to be president again. And so what Taft does, we can see in this picture, they start to have a fight. Um, Taft starts to do his own policies. After his first two years in office, he starts to become more pro-business and he stops busting up trust. Um, he, start, he fires Gifford Pinchot, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's chief forester, and he does away with multiple, land, land, multiple resource management. Um, and he starts to allow businesses to just go ahead and cut down trees and not preserve forests. And so we see Teddy Roosevelt and his successor Taft start to have a, a fight, a pu very public fight, about what should the Republican Party stand for and that Taft is no longer a progressive. And so we are going to see that these two once friends are now going to start to be enemies. So we see a split in the Republican Party starting to occur.